Shalom of Racha, blessing and peace to all of our viewers and friends. My name is Uri Harel, and in the next few minutes, I will share with you some amazing nuggets of information about the Hebrew language. This program and the ones to follow are not intended to make you into a Hebrew scholar or even teach you how to converse with your taxi driver on your next visit to Israel. My intention is to open for you new doors of understanding into this fascinating and exciting mode of communication between God and his people. I'm hoping that knowing something about Hebrew will lead to a better understanding of God's word and a better appreciation for the children of Israel the chosen people who have guarded his word with excellence in the original Hebrew form for 3,500 years to this very day. In previous programs, we took some time to look into Hebrew names in the Bible, biblical Hebrew names, and to explore how they work in English, how they work in Hebrew, and um, the, the sources and, and the meanings of each one of those names. Today I want to spend some time looking into places, names of places in the biblical Hebrew and to see what is the connection between the place and the name that the place got. And it's really fascinating to look into the names and their relationships to the places that... Um, we find stories about them in the Bible. So I'll do some work on, on the board and show you how these names work. The first name I want to <coughs> present to you is Gan Eden. Gan Eden. Two words. The two words. Gan means a garden, and Eden was, of course, translated to English, Eden, but Eden means in Hebrew, uh, pleasant, something pleasant. So I'm sure it was a very pleasant place to be in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden. But uh, uh, the Hebrew has a name for it, and uh, has a meaning to the name. Another name that... I'm looking at is Beit Lechem. Beit Lechem. Or Beit Lechem. Now, Bet Lechem, Beit is Beit, which is a house, and Lechem is bread. Now, that is an interesting name, the house of bread. If you recall um, the story of Ruth, the Moabite. Naomi, who lived with her family in Bethlehem, the house of bread, they did not have bread, they had famine. So she went to, with her husband and children to Moab. And that's where she met Ruth, the Moabite. So Bethlehem is the house of bread, and the word Lechem is interesting by itself. Lechem is bread, but the root that this word comes from is... Um, a war, fighting, engagement in fighting, lechem, milchama is a war. So, and lochem is a fighter, is a, a soldier. So you ask yourself, why is the word lechem, which is bread, comes from the root that has to do with war? What is the connection? And a possible connection was that in ancient times, there were two kinds of societies. You had a nomad society that was moving around, and you had a stationary society that lived in cities <coughs> or in settlements. And the, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, societies that lived in settlements, <coughs> societies that lived in settlements had more than the nomads, because in a settlement you have the combined power of the society, of the people in the society, and uh, they would produce things that a nomad cannot do. They would, uh, the whole idea of uh, um, 
planting cycle, um, planting the seeds, watering it, making sure it grows, and seasons, and um, taking it out of the ground, and, and grinding this, the, the, separating the shaft from the seeds, and taking the seeds to a place where you grind it, and then you grind it, you make the um, powder from it, whatever it was, and then you bake it, in the case of bread, you bake and uh, then you have bread. So bread is not something that you can make by yourself. Not one person cannot make bread. It takes a community effort, and it takes a whole cycle of a year of the seasons to actually create that which is bread. So that was unique to a stationary society. So if you have a nomad society, and they want the wealth of the stationary society, then they would attack them and they would attack for what the bread symbolizes, the united effort that the society put together to produce things, whether it's food or other things. So lechem, which is a symbol of that cycle of effort that it takes to grow the wheat into and to bring it all, all the way through the cycle into a loaf of bread, that bread, lechem, comes from milchama, from lochem, from fighting, from a war, because it symbolized that interaction between the stationary society and the nomad society. So bet lechem, the house of bread. Then we have bet el. Bet el. And those of you who listened to th this program for a while probably recognize that Beit is Bait, which is the house, and then El is God, so the house of God. And of course, Beit El was called that by Jacob, who put his head to sleep on a stone and dreamt about this ladder, ladder that is going up, and you have the And he wakes up in the morning and he says, there must be God in this place. So he called it Bet El, the house of God. And that's Bet El. Then we have interesting names like so Sodom or Sodom, Sodom. And Sodom comes from the word Sad. In Hebrew, that Sad is what in medieval Europe, they had different torture devices. So sad was one of the devices which we all recognize. They would take a person and put him in a, uh, a stock, in the stocks, and um, they will put him in a city square, and it wasn't a killing device, it was a humiliation device. They would put him there, and people would go by and spit on him and laugh at him and stuff like that and hit him. So the, the, the stocks, that the sad in Hebrew, Sdom. And obviously, we all heard the stories about how bad uh, Sdom was and Sodom, you know, with, with the people there, and they were uh, evil people, and they were doing torture on each other and on other people and stuff like that. So that's a, a fitting name for the city of Sdom. And then we have Amora, which was translated into English Gamora. Amora. And that comes from a root, Ain Mem Resh, Amar, which is Lehit Amer in Hebrew, is to torture. So again, we have torture in that name. So Sdom the Amora, or Sodom and Gemora, the cities of torture, a fitting name for them. And then, a little bit away from that, is the city of Yericho, or Jericho, Yericho. Yericho. And that comes from the word Yareach, and Yareach is the moon. So there is a, there is a, um, a plain, and the city is in the plain, and the moon would rise behind the mountains of uh, Moab and Edom 
and they you would see the, the moon rising over at the east and going through the sky through the night to the other side. So that is the city of Yericho, a city where you can see the moon from. And that, that was that. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, another, let me make some room here and give you some more spaces, more names of places to enjoy. And here it is. The city of Babel, Babel, Babel. Babel, and we I actually use that word in English as Babel. To Babel is to, to steer or to, to say something incoherent. So Babel was the place where God confused the languages and um, he steered the languages and confused them. And that's what we got in the city of Babel, Babel. And uh, what there are is interesting names of countries in the Middle East. And if you know the meaning of the names, you'll see the irony of history, how people called their countries by these names. And um, I want to start with the, si the country of Egypt. Egypt is called Mitzrayim in the Bible. Mitzrayim. Egypt is more, um, came up uh, later, and it's probably based on a Greek name, but the, the Egyptians themselves in Arabic call their country Masr, which comes from Mitzrayim. So let's take a look and see what, mi what Mitzrayim means in, uh, in Hebrew. Mitzrayim comes from the word Tsar, which is spelled like this. Tsar means narrow. And Mitzrayim was called that because it's the uh, condition of the country was symbolized by the ex exodus of the Jews out of Egypt and the story where they got to the uh, sea of Reeds, and Moses opened the sea, and the children of Israel went in the dry land, crossed to the other side, and then the Egyptians that were pursuing them were um, covered by the water. But there was a situation there where the, um, the children of Israel were back to the sea, to the water, and the Egyptians were coming to pursue them, and they had no place to go. So that was a moment of, of uh, being between a rock and a hard place, being back to the water. So the word Mitzrayim means between, uh, the, it means uh, something that is backing you to the wall. It's uh, a narrow place, being in a narrow place. And it's interesting that the Egyptians themselves are calling themselves that name in their language, which I'm sure they never gave much thought to that or thought about what it means, but that's what it means. Then we have the country of Jordan, Yarden. Yarden comes from the word Yarad in Hebrew, which is to descent, to come down. And Yarden is the name of the river that goes from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. It's called Yarden, or in English, Jordan, the Jordan River. So Yarden means to descend, to go down. Why would a country be called Yarden? Surya, or Syria, has the word Sur in it, Surya. And sur in Hebrew means to deviate, to deviate from the right way, to deviate from the straight way. So Surya, what it means in Hebrew is that country that deviated. Why would a country be called Surya, not understanding the meaning of the name? 
that is interesting. Let's take another um, place, which is, or another people, the Palestinians. Let's go and look at the origin of the name Palestinians. Now, when the children of Israel left Egypt, there, of course, there was the easy way to go along the coast to go from the Nile and travel north through the coast or travel east and north through the coast to get to Canaan, to, this, to the, uh, the land of Israel. But it says in the Bible that God did not want them to go that way because they might, they're just slaves, they just came out of slavery and they might face the Philistines or the Pelishtim who lived along the coast and they will see war and return to Egypt. So he threw them through the other way, through the Sinai Desert, took them down south to where the um, Mount Sinai is and gave them the tour there and then they roamed the desert for 40 years until they came to the land of Israel from the other side. So who are those Philistines? The word plishtim in Hebrew, plishtim, the word plishtim in Hebrew is based on the word peleshet, which is the invaders. So basically the plishtim were the invaders, and they were called that in Hebrew, plishtim. Later on, they gave a lot of trouble to King David, and um, eventually they disappeared from um, the, the area after many, many years of wars, but they occupied that strip that could, today is called the Gaza Strip, Aza. So the Polish teams, the invaders, later on the Roman Empire to humiliate the Jews after the rebellion and the destruction of the Second Temple, they gave that land the name of uh, uh, the Pelishtim. They call it Fel um, Palestine. And um, the reason was they knew the history. They knew that the, the, the children of Israel and the Philistines were um, enemies and they caused them a lot of trouble. So they almost like renewed the name just to humiliate the Jews. And then 2,000 years later, that place was still was called Palestine uh, and uh, the um, British Empire, the, the British Mandate, continued with that name until the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, which now it became the land of Israel, uh, the, the State of Israel, in the land of Israel. So the Pelishtim were the invaders why would someone come in the 20th century and reinvent the name and adopt it and call themselves Pelishtim or Palestinians and call themselves the invaders? Don't they want to show that they really were there for whatever they claim and stuff? Really what they're saying is we are the invaders by calling themselves Pelishtim, which is an interesting irony of, of history, how names play. Let me make some room for some more fascinating names like that. And here they come. I mentioned the Gaza Strip. Aza in Hebrew. It's an Ain, Zain, Hey. Aza which was translated in English to Gaza. And that, ne that name came from Az, which implies aggressiveness and um, in, your, in, in spite, in your face. Um, the word Ez in Hebrew is a goat, and the goat is known for its... Um, uh, behavior and its uh, aggressive behavior. So Aza. Uh, then we have uh, 
places that are more modern, like Kineret. Kineret Kineret is the name of the Sea of Galilee in Hebrew. Yam Kineret, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Kineret. Kineret comes from the word Kinor, which is a, a harp, like the harp of David, and because of its shape. The Kineret is shaped almost like a harp. So it's called the Sea of Harp, or the Sea of Kineret. Um, we have Yam Suf. Yam Suf was the sea of reeds, the way it is in the Bible. And the interesting thing is that in one of the translations at some point in history, they translated it um, the Red Sea instead of Reed Sea, and um, that name stuck. So now it's the Red Sea. If you go to the Red Sea, there is nothing red about it. It's blue like any other sea, and it's water and there is no red in it. But people are thinking of it as the Red Sea, which really it, it's based on just a mistake. It's really the Reed Sea, the way Yam Suf. Suf in Hebrew <coughs> is Reed. We have a word that we use for desert, Midbar. And here is how it goes. Here is how it goes, Midbar. Midbar. <coughs> In English, Midbar is a desert. The translation of it literally is a desert. But in Hebrew, Midbar comes from Davar. Ledaber is to speak. So if you really want a literal translation of Midbar, it means the place in which the word was spoken. So when you say the Mojave Desert, you would call it Midbar Mojave in Hebrew, the, w the place where the word was spoken, and in this case, it's the Mojave Desert. So in Hebrew, we don't have a name for an arid area, a place where it's, it's a completely um, a desert. Why is it called the place which with the word was spoken in? because the word was spoken in the Sinai desert, and that's where the children of Israel received the Torah. They received the word of God. So instead of referring to it as an arid, dry, lifeless place, it's referred to as the place where the word was spoken, which is telling you what happened there rather than the condition of the place itself. Um, we have um, in the north of Israel, the northern, the very northern place is Dan. And of course, Dan is taken from the tribe, the name Dan, from the tribe of Dan. And um, later on, it's an interesting phenomena that some people can ponder upon. We have the name Dan inserted in many places. After the, we lost track of the 10 tribes of Israel from the north of Israel that were exiled by the Assyrians. And, and of course, they were assimilated or dissipated or, or went away. We don't know where they are anymore. But we have names with Dan in different places. We have Dan Mark, Denmark. We have Dan Yeper and Dan Nuba and all kind of places where the name Dan is inserted in, in Europe and in some other places. So that's an interesting thing. Now, um, an interesting place, another place, is what we call Moab. Moab. And Moab, if you recall, is um, where Ruth the Moabite came from. So Ruth the Moabite came from Moab. And what is Moab? Moab is a place which today is 
in Jordan. Those are the mountains that you see from the city of Jericho, and you look up to the east and you see Moab, Moab. But what is Moab? Mo, usually in Hebrew, means in his own, by his own, by his own hands, by his own. And Av means father. So wh who is Moab? Moab was the uh, child of the relationship between the daughter of Lot after the destruction of the city of Jericho and her father, which they made him drink and he didn't know what he was doing and they got seed out of the father. So Moab, by, his own fa by her own father, she got the son. So the name is fitting exactly to what the story was, what they uh, mean and we are using it until this day. So we went over some names of places in the Bible, and I hope that will encourage you a little bit to um, get some more information, read more, because the Bible is fascinating not only in the stories, but when you start to understand the Hebrew words and uh, the Hebrew words of, name, of places and people, you'll enjoy it more. Thank you for joining us in learning something about Hebrew today. I hope that this program will motivate you to continue in your quest for more knowledge and understanding of God's Word. I would like to invite you to visit our website at musicfromgod.com, musicfromgod.com, to explore some of our products and Hebrew learning aids. When you visit our Music From God website, please sign up for our free informative newsletter. Just mention that you heard about us on GLC and we will send you a small gift as a, our way of saying thank you for your support. Learning Hebrew is fun and rewarding. Just come visit us on musicfromgod.com or call us on 602-48-BIBLE, 602-48-BIBLE. See you again soon. And Shalom.